It is so good to be here and to see you. Thank you for your warm welcome. Um, you still insist on that picture. <laughs> I do believe there is something dark going on here because I have rebuked that picture twice when I've been here and you persist. So somebody, somebody is doing something dark. I will get to the bottom of this. Next time I come, if I come, if I come, I want that replaced with a picture of Harry Kane. That would be good. So are you feeling confident about the uh, Euros? You are. No, you're not. No, you're not. You all know that France are going to win. <laughs> I was wondering where he was. There's a pillar here. I, could, I was thinking, where's Dave? And then I hear singing. Oh, he's behind the pillar. There you go. Okay, so um, England probably aren't going to win. I'll just say that. I'll get it out there. Just to get, get the pain out the way, because you know it's a very, very painful subject for England. But maybe Deutschland won't win either. Who knows? Uh, I, th I think probably neither of us will. But uh, Guys, it is so good to be here. I'm so looking forward to tomorrow night, where I get to gather with some of the, the folks who are involved in the Potsdam uh, plan, which is so encouraging and exciting. And I just want to say, you guys are inspiring. Uh, it's just wow. You know, God's doing something so precious here in this city and gathering this wonderful church, but also beginning to reach out into beyond and touch cities outside. Uh, this, is, this is King Jesus um, building his church and uh, reaching, reaching the communities, the cities that this world is uh, uh, so, so uh, full of that desperately need his, his saving grace. That's what we're about, and you, you're doing great in stepping forward, taking big, big new steps, faith steps, not knowing quite what's going to happen, but, but that's, that's Jesus' business, and we just obey him. And I just want to encourage you and affirm you in that and say, well done. Just keep with this. It's very, very inspiring. And I love it. Uh, I'm going to be teaching from the book of Ephesians. Um, I know you did Ephesians last year. I just want to go back and do one particular theme that's so important in chapter 4. And so we're going to be reading from there. Recently, I, 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 I asked myself the question, what is Jesus doing now? You know, what is Jesus? If, if he rose from the dead, he must be doing something. What's he doing now? And we teach a lot uh, about what Jesus has done. And we sometimes teach about what he will do. But the Bible also has things to say about now, what he's doing, what he has on his front burner, if you like, like if he's got a, a gas stove, you know, what's, there's, there's the back burner, there's some things he's going to do one day, you know, he's, he's got those coming, he's, got the, the, he's taking care of those, they're just as important, but he's also got a front burner, he's got stuff that he's doing right now, that he's busy with right now, and the Bible does tell us some clues in different places, I want to use one of those places in scripture today to help us to see a really important thing for us as a church, now, Mosaic is a growing church it's an exciting church seeing new people coming in all the time and when that happens there's a there's a sense of freshness and flourishing and newness but in the midst of it if if, if Jesus is serving the church uh, the way he promises to uh, he will also be building something more rich under the surface so we notice the new faces and the crowds and the numbers and the, the gathering but what Jesus is doing all the time through it is building family, building connection, drawing us into something tighter than just a crowd. And, and in order for that to happen, he gives us gifts, special gifts that I'm going to just show you about in this passage. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 4, and I'm going to quickly read from verse 4 uh, uh, down a cliff or, or um, climb up uh, a steep chasm or, or something, or you know, a, a risk murder from some assassins and, and, and the climax of each one of these short adverts was that he would walk into some boudoir, uh, some, some lady's room and just place a, a box on the side while she was asleep because it was at night time and then he would jump out the window and fly away, you know, on a parachute or something and then the, the, the caption each, each time was all because the lady loves milk tray which is like a chocolate in England. Some of you, you remember because you lived in England at the time or you heard of this. It was awful. Uh, but it was a common advert on television and it was very cheesy and ugh. But, but, 
the, the idea that, that it gives, it kind of, this passage of scripture actually slightly reminds me because you have this, this story Paul is telling of this great hero, this great warrior who descended from his high position. He went to the deepest depths and suffered and was crucified, buried, and then ascended. He was raised up to a place of authority to be conquering king, filling all things. And he went through all of this great trouble to give a gift, to give gifts to his bride, to bless his bride, to love his bride, to cherish. This is the story the Bible tells. And here Paul is saying that in all that he was doing, one of the things that he was doing it for, one of the gifts that he wanted so devotedly to pour out kindly upon his people was church leaders. Well, that's a bit of an anticlimax for us. <laughs> us kind of 21st century Western people. We, we don't find that a very inspiring gift. You know, that's a bit like someone abseiling into a bedroom to put some chocolates there. It's like, yeah, thanks. Maybe you've been given a gift by someone and you're kind of like, you don't really like it, but you can't say anything because you know they've gone to great trouble to give it to you. And you feel awkward. You're like, Ooh, you really worked hard at this, but I just don't like it. And, and we have exactly that here. It's like Jesus has gone to great lengths to give us something that we would be like, yeah, it's okay. I'm not saying that we dislike it. It's just that we're kind of indifferent. We are a little bit because our tendency is to see leadership as almost a kind of, really a sort of a, a necessary evil. We, we know that we don't really like people being in charge of us, but we probably prefer it to the alternative, which is chaos. You know, we don't like anarchy. We like the trains running on time, and we like uh, the, you know, the, the food to be on the shelves, and we like things to run. And, and so we think, oh, we probably need to have someone in charge, but we, we don't really want them. We see them as just necessary, so we tolerate them. That's our, our position. And, and I suppose partly that's because of something that the Bible describes at the very start of our human story. Our, our instinct as human beings is to have a slight distrust of those in leadership, those in authority over us. It's, it's there, it's instinctive, it's in our wiring. We're kind of, we've broken the system a little bit. When the Bible says when we were first made, we were made for relationship with him to carry authority, each one of us having influence, having things to do. But under his authority because he's at the center of it all not me just as we've been singing he is at the center I, I get to be part of it but I don't get to be at the center the Bible says that's in the human that's in, that's in the human condition it's, it's there for all of us all of us without exception and I, I don't know if you're a parent I notice this as a father, this is, I, I noticed, on those, you ever seen on those movies where like a, a, a nature programs where a, a calf gets born or a, like a, a lamb gets born? I'm always staggered by how quickly they kind of, they literally just come out of the womb and they just get up and walk around. It's amazing. Like little, I've seen it on farms as well. Like little lambs just get up and walk around. Like how did they, my kids did not do that. It was a lot of work getting them to walk. But they didn't need any training at all to say to me, no. Every one of my kids is like, oh, there it is. There it is. That, that natural instinct that they don't need training for to, to resist and even resent the imposition of authority is human. That's a human thing. It's, it shouldn't culturally. So it's not just the uh, species, the human species. It's also the kind of Western 21st century species, the, the modern uh, uh, humanity, which through various things, different worldviews that have influenced us, and lots of just technological changes, things that have made us 
that have really shaped around our desire for personal freedom and kind of enshrined it, made it almost into a religion where personal choice, individual autonomy is kind of lifted up as the most important, even the most holy thing. And so we, we, we take it as a, as a, as a, it's funny, even you know, arriving at the airport, I see the, uh, the, the quotation from, um, I can't remember which one of your uh, 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 chancellors it was, uh, Sch uh, Schmidt maybe, the, the quotation about freedom above, above all things. And that's not a bad thing, but the way that we in the West have interpreted it is ultimately, it's a little bit like the difference between a, a, if you see a tree with branches and twigs where every part is connected to a whole and dependent, interdependent, or a beach with pebbles where you get a whole kind of mush of different objects lying on top of each other, but they're not actually connected. And the 21st century Western world is more like that beach where we just kind of, we're thrown into cultures like big cities like Berlin. We're connected, we're next to people, we're sitting next to people now. But our sense of connection may be nothing. We don't feel ourselves, we don't identify ourselves as part of something bigger than ourselves. We identify ourselves as autonomous and the center of things. And the way that we've worked technology and trade affects that. So things like just the car, for example, that was a game changer, that you could literally be hundreds of miles away, or, or you, know, you could be 50 miles away in about an hour, if the traffic's okay. That's a big deal. That changes things big time. That changes things certainly in the church world, because it means suddenly we've got options. And when, when a, a, a church doesn't really suit me, or starts just teaching something that I don't like, I've got options. And I treat the church like I treat anything else, like a, like, a, like a customer. And the customer is always right. So we now have Google ratings for churches. So that's, that's how we, and, and, and church leaders relate to the public as consumers, customers. This is my product, please can you, please can you like it? And then, and then, and then you know, we will have success. But when I look at the Bible, I see a very, very different situation pervading. I see, I see a, a culture which is, which is quite distinct from that, which is more like the tree image, more like the interconnectedness, more like the dependence and receiving of input and the humility. And I'm part of something bigger. This is more like a family. And maybe we feel scared of that and prickly about it, nervous and uncomfortable. And I do understand that. I do get that. But we need to acknowledge it as a Bible thing and rethink ourselves in the light of it. There's also a third reason. So I've named the species issue. I've named the culture issue. But there's also just the, for many of us, the personal issue that we may have just had too many burns. We may have just been abused by authority. That we resent authority partly because, yeah, we just got hurt. We got hurt by people who should have known better. People who lead us. People who are responsible for us. Even family or, or bosses or, or even church leaders. And we can be hurt to the point where we think, forget it. I, I, I just don't trust anymore. I won't, I, when I hear that word authority, it's like, yuck. Because I've, I've, I've tasted it and it was nasty. And again, I, I think, <laughs> I get that big time. I, I I, I understand that. But here's the thing. What we tend to do is overcorrect. So we see something done badly, and we think the solution is don't ever do it. But that can't be the solution every time. If something's done badly, it doesn't mean that the thing that was done should never be done. It means it was done badly. And that means we know it can be done better. And then we look at the Bible, we see it's done all the time in the Bible. And it's often done badly, but it's often done better as well. The Bible's very honest. And so the way to deal with it is not to say, well, I'll just chuck that out. We do tend to do that very often. We, we chuck things away. We say, well, we, don't, we, we won't have that here in this church. We won't have that because it's been done badly in other churches. 
that, that may be a good reason, but it also may not be. It may be that it's been done badly in the other churches, but that means we get to redeem it and do it properly. We can see it properly flourish if we ask for Jesus' help and, and read the scriptures and ask God to help us move forward and we can see what we can do better that way. What sometimes happens is we, we have a, a kind of a poison notion of leadership and so we say, well, we won't have leadership. I've seen communities, I've seen churches, they're usually very small, where people say, we don't have leaders here. We don't have a leader. And you, you can see why they say it. It's just, they're kind of uncomfortable with the whole idea of a leader. <laughs> so so they, have, they don't have an official one. But if you spend 10 minutes in that church, you realize, yeah, you do have leaders. You do. <laughs> you spend long enough, you realize, yeah, there are certain people that, okay, you don't, you don't criticize that person. Or you don't go against what that person says. And everyone's scared of that person. We have unofficial leaders. We have unofficial leaders. And that's, that's just as bad. We can't really escape leadership. It's a bit like trying to escape your shadow. There will be people who will influence, who will lead. The question isn't whether we have them. The question is, are they the qualified people? Are they the people the Bible says should lead? Are they the people that that should be freed with the gifts that Jesus has given? Are they the genuine gifts from the heart of God? That's what we're looking for. Now, this is obviously just to say up front. This message is a nice one for me to bring because I'm outside of Berlin. (laughs) So it's nice and easy for me to bring you this message. Uh, Dave did not say to me, Joel, could you please bring a message to the church on how to uh, be, you know, that would be fun. I mean, if, if, if Dave actually started a sermon series on how to receive me as a great leader, I think you'd understandably be a bit nervous. So I'm, no one's asked me, this hasn't been raised or suggested. I'm doing this because I know as an outsider how this works. I know this is important for you as a community. As you grow and flourish, Jesus will raise up gifts amongst you to serve you. And it's right for us to receive that and have the spiritual response to it. To receive it as a gift from Jesus, from the heart of God. And it's interesting that that's the kind of language Paul seems to use here. That he he speaks of leaders as from the very heart of God. The way that uh, Paul describes them as as gifts given. You know, I have a memory of uh, of listening to a a young man talking to his dad, a son talking to his father, and they were talking about someone they both knew, and the boy was laughing, because this this man was not um, aesthetically (laughs) favoured. He was not good looking. And, um, and this, this boy said to his dad, this guy, is, he's, he's not God's gift to women, is he, dad? And the dad said to him, I think you'll find that he is God's gift to his wife. That's a good answer. That's, that's how it works. Jesus knows what we need. Jesus knows the gift that we receive. When Jesus raises up leaders for churches, he does it knowingly, lovingly. There's a gift, there's a kindness. When Paul talks about this, he talks about it from, as a heart thing. Going back into in the Old Testament, the prophet Jeremiah spoke about God's desire to give to his people shepherds after my own heart. People who, they, they reflect the heart of God. It's like, they, there's, some, there's something about the heart of God that, that is expressed in the giving of, of those who lead us spiritually. And of course, this, this obviously does refer to those who are leaders or the leader of a church, but it's much wider than that as a category. There are many amongst you who lead. There are small group leaders. There are department heads. There are those who are running different teams. There are spiritual fathers and mothers in the room. There are biological fathers and mothers in the room. That is also a spiritual responsibility. That you, you're, All of you in different ways exerting leadership as well. And so we can receive this gift not just from one or two, but from a, a, a range that God provides for, for his house. And I, I, I guess I'm trying to encourage you to do it that way. Do it with that responsive, warm heart, enjoying the gift that God gives. I'm struck as well, looking at this passage, at how Paul kind of 
he, he shows how Jesus creates leaders. He gives us a little bit of a clue in the way he quotes from the Psalms in the Old Testament. So it says in verse 8, Paul talks about this by saying, Therefore it says, When he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth? Now, this is a bit compl- little obscure, so it's, it's, let me explain. It's very simple, really, but he's quoting from a place in the Psalms in the Old Testament. But the interesting thing is that the Psalm he's quoting, Psalm 68, it doesn't actually say it like that. So he says, he's talking about Jesus, he said, he ascended and he gave gifts to men. In Psalm 68, it says, he ascended and he received gifts. And it, and it describes what the gifts were. It's like rebels who have been taken prisoner in the battle. So Jesus is described as this great conquering warrior who wins battles. And if you're in the ancient world and you, you know any stories, you, you can kind of predict what he's going to do with the rebels that he takes prisoners. If you've got rebels who, who have turned against you, well, you, you've got to kill them. That's what would happen in ancient battles. You, just, you can't risk letting them live and use them as an example. Kill them. That's what you do with, with rebels who turn against you. And this great king has received these rebels, received this gift of men. And yet when Paul quotes this to the Ephesians, he says he gave gifts of men. And I think about this, I think this is kind of Paul's story himself. Because what was Paul? Well, Paul was a violent hater of Jesus. He was a rebel. He, Jesus, Paul traveled from city to city to find Christians and lock them up and persecute them. He wanted them to blaspheme. He was trying to destroy Jesus. He hated him. And then one day he met him. And it's like Jesus kind of you know, caught up with him. The great conquering king catches up with the rebel, confronts him in battle, and pulls his sword out, sticks it at his neck, and Paul says, you're going to kill me, you're going to kill me. I can imagine Paul being so frightened because he was, I've hated you for years. All I want is you to die and your followers to die. And Jesus confronts him. The risen Jesus confronts him. And what does Jesus do to him? Does he kill him? Jesus says to him, I forgive you. I love you, I choose you, I'm going to start your life all over again. And I've got a job for you, Paul. I'm going to use you. You're going to suffer, you're going to be broken, you're going to go through pain, but I'm going to make you such a blessing. I'm going to make you such a gift. For centuries, people will read your letters. People will be so blessed through this rebel. I'm going to bless the world. I'm going to turn this rebel into a gift. That's what Jesus does. That's what leaders are. Leaders are not people who've got to the top of the pack and been so impressive and passed so many leader exams and really shone. In it. And Jesus is like, wow, I think I'm going to need this guy. I wish I had that guy on my team. I wish I had, if, if, if only I could just recruit this person. No, 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 no. He finds rebels. He finds people who've turned against him and he makes them into vessels. He makes them into trophies of grace and then he chooses them and he he blesses them and he gives them a future in his service. It's beautiful. And that means a tremendous humbling and breaking down of a true leader. A true spiritual leader in God's house isn't going to be someone who is deeply self-confident, who is deeply... Deeply impressive and full of themselves. Have you noticed, if you read the Bible, if you are that kind of person, you need to watch out. Whenever Jesus chooses someone like that, usually he spends a few years knocking them into shape. That's why Moses was in the desert. That's why Joseph was put in prison. That's why Paul spent years in Arabia. That's, Jesus is good at choosing and then shaping, transforming, taking people to bits and putting them back together again. I'm saying this to say the gift that leaders are, 
we, we get to see Jesus creating and preparing people who are a blessing from his heart, not just professionals, not, not just people who know how to get you know, a few things done. It's, that's, that's not a bad thing, but, but what you'll see is, it's like Paul says to Timothy in another letter, he says, let your progress be evident to all. Let your progress, let, let people see your life, Timothy, and what they'll see is progress. They'll see Jesus is changing you, shaping you, moving you forward. So we're not saying that leaders are perfect at all. The Bible doesn't teach us that. But, but we are seeing that Jesus is a, a good shaper, a good trainer, a good master. He knows how to move us forward. And we can trust him to help us with the people that, he, that we need in our lives. So let me just close this with one or two particular practical things for us. I'm going to really rush through them quickly for the sake of time. There's just, I'll try and cover all of them. The first one is, it's, it's, it says in 1 Thessalonians verse 5, honor, honor those who lead amongst you with the highest esteem. That's 1 Thessalonians and chapter 5. He says, esteem them very highly in love because of their work. So that's, that's countercultural, isn't it? It's like saying, okay, to my mother or father, or to the person that, you know, even to my boss, I'm going to choose to honor one who's in authority. And in the church, those who lead me, those who lead in my small group, those who lead in various contexts, I will choose to honor. The way we do that is worth pondering, because there is a way to do that that's not necessarily the right one. We could do it in a kind of shallow way. Sometimes people think, well, what this means is that we could just kind of whoop, whoop about them or, you know, stick their, stick their, their, stick their face on the screen. No, no. Uh, you know, to kind of make, make the whole thing about them in some kind of over-the-top glamorous way. I don't think that's what the Bible means. I think, what the, I think what the Bible's getting at here, well, how do you really honor people? You actually honor them more by watching their way of life and learning from them by listening to them, by choosing them as people that you would, you would want to learn from. You, you can just celebrate people in a noisy way and then ignore them. I've seen people do that. You know, kind of, woo, 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 you know, the leader is here. And, then, and don't, don't actually listen at all to the, the, the things that God has given them to say. Whereas I think in Scripture, the emphasis is on, it says in Hebrews chapter 13, Remember your leaders and learn from the outcome of their lives. So you're thinking, who are the people in your life that you should follow because you can see the outcome of their life? And you, you will follow someone. I know you, you, some of you, because you're Berliners, you will think, no, I don't follow anybody because I'm independent. I'm, I know that. I'm from Brighton, just the same kind of city. You know, no, no, we don't follow anybody. We're nonconformists around here. All of us. We're so nonconformist that we are all nonconformist altogether. It doesn't work. You can see what I'm saying. It's a paradox. That doesn't really work. If you say, I, I don't follow anybody, you're following the culture that says, don't follow anybody. You can't really avoid this. You will follow someone. It's like trying to run away from your shadow. You can't avoid it. So the choice isn't whether you follow. The choice in the end is who. It's who. Whose life are you watching? Whose wisdom are you receiving? Whose outcome of life are you emulating? That's a choice you get to make. The Bible says, watch, look at the outcome of life, the leaders that God's given you. If, you. if you can get close to people and listen and learn and spend time with them, all the better. Do that if you can. I don't mean stalk them. I don't mean best of them, but I do mean humbly receive and listen and watch and learn. Choose who are the people that you're receiving from. I think as well, it means that we genuinely, the Bible says, try to make their experience of this a joy. Again, that's in Hebrews 13. Making their life a joy. Otherwise, it isn't much benefit to us. There's such a thing as just wisdom, thinking, how can I make their life a joy so that they can lead more happily, more joyfully, more freely? 
But then finally, just last thing, and this is important, not blindly. Not blindly. And I just say this as a passing final comment because it is important. The Bible doesn't call us to treat leaders as God. We, the Bible doesn't replace the Bible with leaders. The, the Bible calls us to, to wisdom here. There's, there's lots of ways that this works. For example, it, just one example in the book of Acts where you get the people in Berea. Maybe you know the story. And the apostles are preaching in Berea. And it says the Bereans were more noble than the other people there because they checked what Paul had to say against the Bible, the scriptures, the Old Testament. They checked what he said and, and, and carefully analyzed it against what they saw in the, in the Old Testament. And the, the, the book of Acts says, good, that was the right thing to do. They're honored because they were careful. They're honored because they didn't assume, well, if he says it's right, it's right. If you do that, your conscience can get mauled. You can end up trusting in the wrong way. The, the leader's authority comes from their obedience to this. That's how it works. So we must always treat the scripture with the final authority. And, and we check what leaders say against this final authority. And that makes us safer. So Paul describes this in one place in, the, in 2 Corinthians. He's talking about the church in Philippi. And he's, he's praising this church. And he says to the, the guys in Corinth, he says, those, those Macedonians, they, they, they were so good. They gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us. First to the Lord and then to us. Things get unhealthy when we give ourselves first to somebody else and then to the Lord. That's, that's, that's more dangerous. So in all of our dealings, all of our discipleship and all our following, all our church community life, we, we, we honor and love and receive those that Jesus gives us. But we're not blindly following them. We're following them in obedience to Scripture ultimately. We get it that way around. So these are some key principles for us at Mosaic as we grow, as we move forward. Jesus is building an incredible church here. And there will be more leaders that God's raising up here. God will keep building strength, harmony. There'll be depth. There'll be real relationship. There'll be a sense of family. There'll be, there'll be fathers, elders, overseers that will start to emerge. Shepherds that will, will start to emerge to carry the weight alongside Dave. That will happen more and more and more. And I, I wanted to bring a word to you today that would help you to anticipate that wisely. Receive it as a joy and as a gift. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you again for what you're doing in this great city. We do thank you for the fact that you are risen from the dead. You are ruling over all things for the sake of your body, the church. And you are attentive to your bride, caring for her, nurturing her, and providing her with the gifts of those who are called to serve and lead. And we pray that you would do that here in this city. We pray that you would do it, Lord, in a way that brings health and life change and blessing to thousands in the future. We pray it according to your mercy, in Jesus' name. Let me just ask you before I close, and, and uh, the guys just lead us in worship. In your own heart, in your own heart, just be thinking, who are the people that Jesus has given me? Who are the leaders that God's put in my life? Am I, am I receiving from them? Am I honoring them? Am I watching and learning? Or is it, is it that I'm looking in the wrong places? Am I learning from the wrong authorities? And maybe, maybe, I hope it's true that there's somebody here, maybe several, and it's actually for you, it's like you, you need to meet Jesus. He's the ultimate leader. He's the leader of leaders, as Abel was saying. He's the chief shepherd. And maybe you've not had him come into your life yet. You've not, you've not surrendered to him. You've not trusted him. And we want you to know you, you, you can trust him. Turn to him today. 
Turn to Jesus today. Put your trust in him. Seek him. Ask him to build your life again. Let's stand together.